Hello there, hello there, hello there, hello there, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 758, that is Siete Cinco Ocho of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you're doing well wherever this lovely podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered, all good, all things considered, I cannot complain. I really, truly deep down in my heart of hearts cannot complain and I hope you're doing just as well as I am on this lovely nondescript day as I talk to you live and direct from an undisclosed location somewhere in the depths of London. So I've just got well I've just jumped off or finished listening to Cowboy Carter Beyonce's recent new album has just dropped hot off the press I've had one through listen to it all the way through. It's 27 tracks. For a lot of people, it's going to be a little bit too much to listen to all in one go. But being a bit of a music freak that I am, I did do it. Now, to be fair to her, 27 tracks is a little bit, it's a bit, it kind of, um, it's, it doesn't feel like 27 tracks, basically. There's a lot of interludes and vibey, atmospheric type of skits and whatever we call. There's loads of like, tunes in the album that you would describe as skits most likely or you know um that do a good job of sort of like telling the story of the overall album and kind of giving it a theme kind of giving it a vibe and just kind of getting you in a zone of what she's trying to go for now the title of the album was very very off-putting or kind of misleading sorry cowboy carter when i first heard the title of the album i assumed she was going country there are some country records on there. There's some country icons on there. Dolly Parton, to name to name but one, and a few others who I probably don't even recognize their voices. But it's not a country album. Essentially, from what I can gather, having listened to it the whole way through once, and I've not gone online and seen any theories or whatnot. But you know, judging by the fact that Beyonce is from Houston, Texas, or whatever, it's given me more sort of a vibe of this is more like a of, um, of her attempt to tell her story whether it's a story through her eyes through her own eyes growing up in houston texas whether it's her basically taking on the persona of her mom or somebody else in her family and basically telling their story through these different songs because the older you get usually especially you know the more fame that they have they probably have more resources now more access to different people so maybe different members of their family are now coming up with different stories or other members of the family are now being unearthed who are now being able to piece together bit by bit the different um you know story of their entire family and now she wants to kind of put it together in a sort of musical package and considering how divided the country is and america and shit it's a, maybe a good way of maybe trying to, you know, knit things together and kind of show, you know, essentially you're all equal underneath that Stars and Stripes banner or something. I don't know. That's what I'm That's what I'm currently seeing in the album. It's almost a little bit more preachy than it is about celebrating country music. It almost seems a little bit like, hey, remember when we were the United States of America? Remember when we were, when we were the home of the free, land of the brave or whatever that fucking term is. That's why I'm currently getting listening to the Beyonce Carter album. Um, Cowboy Carter, sorry. The first way through listening to it, I was really impressed. I'm not going to lie. Even though there's a lot of like interludes and skits and whatnot, um, probably a little bit too many than I would like. It does a good job of kind of telling the story. It does a good job of tying everything together. And I think theoretically, it just kind of, you know, it works. But, you know, as per usual, when it comes to these type of albums, the quality of it it just sounds expensive even though this feels like i don't know i i know there, there was a press release that came out that said beyonce has been working on this album for years um and everything else but even but it kind of feels like it was turned around quickly in my opinion again i could be wrong even if it was it still feels like a lot of good money was spent to get this to sound a certain way it just hits differently on your eardrums, which is interesting considering the amount of albums I've kind of listened to this year and just generally the albums that we all listen to on a timeline and shit. It's always a good reminder to see like, you know, the difference between like the the artists that we all know and love and then the top, top tier ones that, uh, you know, 
the ones who command all the big bucks, the ones that tour fucking stadiums around the world and shit, because this album sounds incredibly expensive. Um, it sounds like it's had a million people work on it, t you know, fine tune it, touch it up, and make sure that it's the precise project needs to be when it eventually drops. Um, I can't wait to listen to it again one more time to kind of give it one more listen. But I do recommend you check it out. Beyonce, Cowboy Carter, one listen so far. And I've really, really enjoyed it. I cannot complain. I cannot lie. And I cannot complain. Moving on from that one on the music front. I saw this clip on Twitter and I thought I need to talk about it. Because I think this is a very, this is maybe representative of where we are in culture. And it's also a reminder of how difficult it must be to be a musician nowadays especially if you're like a young kid so there's this video online that i saw on twitter that features xqc the streamer aiden ross sitting down with trippy red and mgk as you guys will know trippy red and mgk put out um, a joint collaborative ep project it's about 10 songs long or something i listened to a couple of tracks off of it it's pretty decent not anything to shout home about the first thing I kind of thought when listening to the project was like, rah, man, Trippy Red is probably as musically confused as MGK is. MGK seems to jump on different genres, different sort of like identities, personas, themes with every single album that he does. And they're both kind of lost, I feel like, musically. So maybe this is the perfect match for them or the perfect situation where they can kind of jump on a, a fucking track together or an album, put together an EP album together and maybe try and find their footing because, you know, they still haven't kind of, I don't feel like, especially Trippie Red's case, they still haven't fulfilled their potential. So that was what I first thought when I kind of listened to the album. The other thing I thought when I listened to the album was that, oh, these guys have been kind of cold for a while, especially Trippy Red. He, he probably needs this EP to work and to do something to kind of give him a bit of a jolt so he can go in the right direction. And I kind of immediately thought to myself, Ra, man, imagine what Kanye would do for a trippy red. Imagine what a Ye feature would do for him in the same way that Rich the Kid was completely ice cold. No one's really checking for him. He, you know, Ye plucks him from, you know, from obscurity, gets him to write one of the best verses he's ever written in his entire life on Carnival. Maybe the, one of the best verses this year, actually. And now, you know, he's, you know, the, the landscape for Trippy Red is looking completely different after that one record. And maybe that's what Trippy Red needs, you know. He needs that Rich the Kid treatment. He needs somebody with a little bit more refinement, a little bit more of a vision, a little bit more of a genius, a little bit more of a, you know, savant when it comes to that side of things, production and shit, just to kind of help him fine tune things. Because when he lifts his own devices, the albums, mixtapes are all over the place. Anyway, all that to say... These two guys in MGK and now Trippy Red are now sitting down the stream with XQC and Aiden Ross in an attempt to kind of, you know, market themselves, um, to let people know that they've got an album out there, connect with some new fans, maybe get some new fans. But this particular interaction is funny because it shows Trippy Red not being that entertained or not being that, you know, um, happy with the situation because he's sitting in a room with XQC and Aiden Ross, they're talking between each other, and he feels like all the tension should be on him and MGK or the music. So let me play the clip for you, and then I'll say to you my comment on the other side. I talked when I was on cocaine. Yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. People yeah. said that about my, my boy times. X got that energy. <laughs> my, my, boy, my boy X got that energy. Yeah, I don't mind. I, I'm on two pouches in the fucking... I talked when I was on cocaine. Yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, people yeah. said that about my, me. My so as you can tell from that video, Trippy Red doesn't seem to be too entertained by being around Aiden Ross and XQC. But the funny thing about the situation I thought about when I saw this was that these guys, they kind of need Aiden Ross and XQC more than XQC and Aiden Ross need them. This is the unfortunate situation we're in now when it comes to music and for these guys in particular. Culture has shifted and changed so much where there are probably kids out there who probably don't even listen to music that much. They probably spend most of their time with a playlist playing on in the background with just some random tunes or maybe their Spotify is just on autoplay. Whatever song that they like, they play that first and then all Spotify would just, you know, um, recommend some tunes after the fact that probably fit the theme of the previous song. So it's probably not even songs that they even selected themselves. And then they're just online watching streamers or playing video games. So the need for music or these musicians is completely gone. It's not the same as it was before. So... In this particular situation, Trippy Red is sitting there and he probably feels like he's way cooler than XQC and Aiden Ross. 
But the unfortunate situation is that he may think that in his head, but to the kids coming up nowadays, the coolest people in the world are streamers. The coolest people in the world are content creators, not these artists who are, you know, up and down, um, inconsistent with their albums. In Trippy Red's case, they cancel their tours, depending on if they're in love or not in love. It's all over the place. But the one people they can, the one group of people they can really depend on, come rain or shine, for the most part, to give them, you know, two, four hours, maybe six hours plus every day of free content, is going to be these streamers. So in this particular situation, even though, even though Triple Red feels like he's too cool for school for these guys, he actually needs them more than they need them. Which is why I would also say my second part of this, um, you know, overview on what I see in this video is that I wish more of these hip hop artists would embrace these platforms and these situations more and go into it with a little bit more of a happier, positive attitude and not treat it like they're going on radio because it's not radio. You're going to go stream with two probably super successful people in their field, super young also, sh within your kind of peer group, whatever it may be, and you also have the ability or maybe the potential to connect with a whole group of like new fans out there, mostly kids as well, who you'd imagine if you're able to kind of catch these kids at like any age between like 10 to 13, you can maybe have some fans that you can maybe have until the rest of your life and fans that you probably would have never got if you didn't sit on that stream. So I wish a lot more of these musicians or these artists, especially hip hop ones, wouldn't act like too cool for school, wouldn't go on these streams and be too big time and have a crazy ego and just go on there and enjoy themselves. Because legitimately, if you went on and enjoy yourself in the same way that Offset did that incredible stream with fucking Kai Sina that went really well, it could actually help you. It could actually help to kind of bolster your career music wise. It could actually help to kind of change the narrative or perception around you. But, you know, Trippy Red's always had a bit of a crazy ego when it comes to himself and his art and shit. But I think in this particular situation, he kind of needs to read the room. He kind of needs to realise that those two guys in front of him are probably way richer than he is and he will probably ever will be. Their careers probably have a much higher ceiling than he has. And in this particular situation, because, you know, with his career being where it is, he definitely needs them more than they need him. I wish he would know that and just enjoy it and have some fun with it and then kind of chill out. But unfortunately not. Let's play this clip one more time. I talked when I was on cocaine. Yeah. Like that. yeah. yeah. People yeah. said that. My, my boy guys. X got that energy. <laughs> my, my boy, my boy X got the energy. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind. I mean, I'm on two pouches in the fucking... I talked when I was on cocaine. Yeah. Like that. So as you can see here, um, Trippy Red isn't entertained by SQC. Another clip here that shows um, Trippy Red acting a bit big time, standing up, like flexing his money. Wait, why you got ones in here bro strip strip club money you ain't got no strippers in here nah i was, I was getting right with sexy god damn i was getting right with sexy right bro. i can't let a stack of money sit nowhere i got like po doesn't he come across like a bit of a cunt trippy red i wish he wasn't like this because i actually do enjoy his music but he does come across like a little bit of a cunt i'm not gonna lie Post traumatic stress <laughs> why you got one and then in other videos there, nope, that's it, basically. So, yeah, Trippy Red and, and MGK on Aiden Ross's stream, trying to connect with the kids, trying to make this a situation, but Trippy Red is too much of a big-time idiot to actually make the situation work in his favor, and most likely, they won't do it again, and most likely, they won't do it again. Then continuing on from that, continuing on from that, I also wanted to touch upon this. So um, somebody actually tweeted this to me earlier on today and kind of like, you know, taking the piss out of little baby and also siding on the side of um, academics and obviously disagreed because I don't really like this attitude and I don't really like this sort of like exchanges in general. I feel like as much as I enjoy academics as live streams and I think he's super entertaining. I think the fact that he goes out of his way to pick fights with rappers and to try to sun them because of their lack of sales or because they're full and off or whatever it may be and to almost put himself on the same level as, uh, as an artist has always rubbed me up the wrong way because in my personal opinion, I think it's far harder to be Little Baby than it is to be DJ Academics. It's far harder to make records to try to be a, a current popping hip-hop artist than it is to be a content creator, live streamer, hip hop blogger, new media person, hip hop. It's way harder to be little baby than it is to be academics. So because of that, the margin for error is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly thin. 
the margin for error is incredibly thin, incredibly small. So if little baby, as as we've seen over the last couple of years, if he has a couple of bad features, a couple of dud albums, it's going to be over for you pretty quickly. And you have to fight. You have to really work super hard. You have to be very conscious of the situation that you're in to make sure you can kind of change it for the better. But it's not easy. The only person who I've seen do it kind of like in recent times who's kind of been able to change the perception about them in real time by putting out loads of music and changing their direction artistically has probably been Lil Yeti. And even Lil Yeti is still dividing opinion. But I think he's done a really good job in terms of changing the narrative around him and kind of presenting a different side of himself artistically through his videos, his fits, his collaborations, his projects and shit. It's been a very purposeful and probably hard thought process to kind of get to that situation. And of course, little baby, I feel like is currently there in that place now. So in this particular tweet on the screen, it features um, a snippet from little baby's um, Twitter account where he posts new music loading. And it's him on the highway somewhere, you know, flicking up his fingers and shit. And it looks like when he flicks up his fingers that one of his nails might be painted. So that's the reason why everybody on the internet is going fucking crazy, right? Because it looks like Lil Baby may have painted his nails. And if you know anything about, you know, music nowadays or culture nowadays, the trend now with a lot of rap, rap you know, artists and just young kids in general is to paint their nails like punk rock style. But obviously in hip hop, because it's incredibly misogynistic and people are super dense, especially people like academics, they see any kind of expression outside of wearing clothes as some sort of indication that you want to suck someone's dick, which is weird, right? Just because you're putting some fucking color on your nails doesn't mean you want a penis up your bum. It just means you're trying to, you know, express yourself differently, um, artistically, creatively, rather than wearing trainers or different t-shirts or changing your hairstyle. It's not really that big of a deal. But regardless, academics does think of it as a big deal. So academics quote tweeted that video and said the following, this nigga ain't been the same since Michael Rubin parties. I know I know his, his nails not painted. Man, what's going on in rap? So academics is basically bemoaning the state of rap and saying, oh, rap has gone soft. Rap has turned into a bunch of sticks, whatever it may be. Now, obviously, I disagree with this because I feel like if you're a little baby, even if this isn't congruent with his personality and he's just doing it to fit in and to be a part of the conversation and be to be young and to take part in what's going on, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think Lil Baby, with his career being where it's at, he needs to do anything in his power to get back to where he was prior because things haven't necessarily been working for him the way they probably should. There's lots of reasons behind it, I'm assuming. Um, there is a theory out there that Lil Baby kind of fell off, not because of the music, but because of the young fuck Rico or the, you know, the, the what you call it, um, the YSL Rico because he was obviously associated with those guys artistically. And if I'm not mistaken, at the time when YSL went down, there was rumours that that woman, Fanny Lewis, or the, the lady that was kind of taking down all those Atlanta gangs, had a list of other prominent Atlanta gangs that they were kind of looking at to kind of take down. And obviously with um, Lil Baby being part of that, is it 4PF crew or whatever it may be, and they're another prominent crew out in Atlanta, he got really nervous. And when that happened, he kind of switched tactics and stopped putting out a bunch of music, stop talking a certain way and then started to be a bit more charitable and do loads of community stuff blah 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 which obviously led him to him taking his his eye off the ball that's one theory the other theory is just that he was never that good in the first place i've heard people say that before and that maybe he was overhyped he was maybe overrated and now we're just kind of seeing him kind of return back to his life kind of you know normal level that he kind of should be at personally I feel like it's a bit of both. Um, and I just feel like in general, he probably just needs a little bit more of an artistic kind of like spark, um, a rebrand, a rebirth, an evolution to kind of get himself back where he needs to get to. Unfortunately for Lil Baby though, I don't feel like when I listen to Lil Baby that he has enough of a range to do that or enough of a depth to do that. Like I don't think he has it. I think he he probably is being presented with loads of new ideas by people behind the scenes in the music industry to do different types of projects, to collaborate with different types of people. But he strikes me as the type of person that wouldn't be too comfortable to go into it, you know, hard. He would probably like be a little bit tentative, a little bit nervous, a little bit apprehensive, you know, a little bit, sorry, a little bit apprehensive before he decided to take a big leap to change his career. So he's kind of stuck in this place where he's trying to make his sound work again. When clearly, in my opinion, um, judging on how poorly his singles and features and just music in general has been doing for him, he probably doesn't need to try to make his sound work again. He should probably try to find a new sound. 
and then kind of you know reintroduce himself back to the industry that's what he probably should probably should do but going back to this DJ academics and little baby beef they've been going back and forth for a long time anyway but i just feel like there is a lack of respect a lack of consideration being placed or that, that, that there's lack of respect and consideration from the new media side of guys like the academics for how hard it is to be a popping artist because Lil Baby isn't some underground artist that kind of fell off. Lil Baby was a legit, what you'd imagine, what you'd just call a quote-unquote mainstream artist, right? And I feel like keeping that level of output at a certain level of quality is incredibly difficult, especially when you're dropping all the time, especially when you've got a fan base that just wants to hear new stuff from you every single time you pop out. It's just an almost, I won't say impossible, but it's just a really, really hard job to do. And I don't envy it in the slightest, right? Having to reinvent yourself, think of a new idea, who to collaborate with, when to drop, who to have on features, what sound you're going to go for, what you're going to look like stylistically. It's a nightmare. Whereas the stuff that I do, the stuff that academics does to an obviously higher level and shit, that doesn't require much talent, really, if you think about it. It doesn't even require that much work, especially if you've got like a decent setup. You can just have it already set up in a corner and just jump on whenever somebody does something stupid on social media, react to it, and then suddenly you're getting fucking paid for it. But it's not exactly comparable to being an artist and just attempting to write a verse, to write a hook, you know, to write an outro, to, to harmonize, to add a bass. Like, all these, like, it's just insane how difficult that stuff is to do. But the one thing I you know do like about this generation or this situation we're in at the moment in life is that you can still critique things um you know without people thinking you're a hater and it's just allowed people more access to a lot more music so even if Lil baby for you is your uh, is your guy and he's fallen off you have access to so many different people you can kind of tap into to maybe replace that kind of little baby hole in your discography but my last point on this is this i sometimes wonder if the skewed imbalanced relationship between hip-hop bloggers and the artist has something to do with how uneven the the distribution of money is in the music industry so we all know in the music industry the people who make the most money are the other labels not the artists right each artist for the most part i'm sure i'm sure most of you have seen this stat they get paid something like you know 0.0.0.0.0 or 0.00005 or something or eight um you know cents um you know for every one stream so basically you have to make what you have to stream a track maybe a million times to get maybe a grand if that right especially when you consider everyone you have to pay on your side of things but the people who make the most money are the record labels and maybe at a push some of the digital streaming platforms but for the most part it's the labels the artists don't make the majority of the music the, they don't make the lion's share of the music even though they're the one created it it always goes to some other person suit person whatever it may be now the issue for me is I feel like the same thing is now happening in the blogger space or in the content creator space because someone like an academics, even though he doesn't have any discernible musical talent and he just kind of gave himself the job of being like a hip-hop journalist, right? No one kind of christened him or gave him permission to do so. He just decided one day, hey, I love music. I love talking about music. I'm going to turn on my computer and start talking about it. And he did it and he became super successful. But I also don't think the success of media types is going to help with the quality of music with the relationship they have with the artist because it's so skewed and the reason why i say this is because look at this video look at this video that academics posted on his twitter account where he received delivery of this new maybach mercedes car i'm going to play the, the video for you so you can hear what he's talking about but essentially it's a black and white I don't know, like an E-Class, S-Class, I don't know what they're called. Essentially the same car that you see Virgil Abloh had a collaboration with, but he got his one now in black and white, and it's obviously Maybach as well. So let me, let me play the video for you so you can actually hear what he says. Just got a new delivery, man. Pandemics is here. Pandemics is here. You heard what that nigga Gunner said, man. 600 Maybach, the one with the curtains. Young Gunner one of that boy bought a market. Stop playing, man. New purchase. You know what I mean? I need to, uh, I needed something to celebrate. You know what I mean? Violating these rappers, killing their careers, running the rap game in terms of media, Jesus living Christ. life, being successful, being big act. What's the problem? Anyway, y'all like the color interior? Actions in the back, though. Holy, check this out. It's a really nice now car. Now we living. Two screens. By the way, y'all doing my motto: always cash, no finance. 
Don't you worry. Big Ack is here. I guess to join the stable of uh the Lambo R8, a few other ones. This shit looks so clean. Look, I had to take a shower to hop up in this jump. Anyway, I'm looking for drivers, man. All y'all rappers that kills y'all career, other podcasters who's trash. Come. So you heard him say what he said. So now I'm wondering if sometimes the clash that these artists have with hip hop bloggers has something to do with the fact that a lot of these bloggers probably make way more money than your favorite artist. And that's almost quite depressing when you think about it. Because these guys, careers, <gasps> sorry, are incredibly dependent or totally dependent on the artist being successful or the artist being around in the first place. Without a little, without the little babies of the world, the academics don't really have a job. They don't really survive. But then, unfortunately, because of how the music industry is structured, rappers can't really make much money from their streams or from their music. So you have to start dabbling in other things, maybe start going on tour, maybe selling merch. But then you can only sell merch and go on tour and do those things, right, if you make quality music. So you're stuck in a weird catch chain and tweet situation. But then it's really hard to make quality music, especially nowadays. Um, especially, you know, just given the nature of the beast, especially considering when you pop off and you come into the game, maybe the way you come into the game isn't the way you're going to leave it. And just how difficult it is to kind of consistently keep, you know, reinventing yourself. So there is something amiss going on. And I think a big chunk of it would help, would kind of require the music industry to kind of take a long, hard look at how it's structured and how it can actually aid and help the artists to make a bit more money so that they can be a bit more, you know, they can take more risks in terms of what they actually put out when it comes to their art. Because I feel like at the moment, the reason why we get so much formulaic music the reason why people feel like everything is so uninspired and flat is because a lot of these guys and girls don't really make much money out of music. They don't really go into it with the bestest motivations in the first place. And even if they are going to best motivation, it's hard to kind of get yourself, you know, up to doing something um, when you know you're only going to get 0 0.5, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 cents on the fucking dollar in, in, per each stream. It's just not worth it. So there is definitely an imbalance there. I wish the, re the imbalance could get corrected. But I also think if you're a blogger, like an academics, you don't need to kind of insert yourself in the situation and kind of put yourself on the same level as an artist because you're not an artist. Um, artists are where they are because they're work because they're they're the ones that are willing to take that risk to create that work in order for people like myself and academics on a higher level to kind of critique, and they're the ones that are should be at the top of the totem pole. But unfortunately, the way music is structured, they're not. They have to be subservient to like the you know guys that are academics, and things never really transpired that well for them. So sad situation overall. Um, I really do hope little baby figures it out. I really would like to see him win and kind of, you know, make a comeback. But like I said, you know, listening to his old records, listening to some of these new tunes he's put out and just him as a personality, I just don't see if he has the introspection needed to do some of the, you know, the work to kind of come back out with a new sound because it feels like he's just trying to resuscitate that old sound he had when he first popped out and trying to make it work again. I just don't think it's going to happen. He needs to come with something else, but I'm not too sure if he's got the capacity to do that something else unless he gets pushed to do it. So let's see how it happens. Let's see how it transpires, but it's not looking that great so far. It's not looking that great so far for the one and only Lil Baby. Continuing on from that, obviously you got an update courtesy of the Diddy stuff. You know I'm obviously obsessed with this, as are most people online. Um, I'm still mulling over the idea in my head. Why is it not possible for people like Diddy, who are that freaky, to do it with consenting adults? Why isn't it possible to be that freaky, hedonistic, crazy dude without it going into kind of, you know, illegal activities, without it harming people? without it destroying people, without you becoming a megalomaniac, a psychopath, an abuser, a harasser, a graper. Like, why is it not possible to do that? Because I'm sure that lifestyle of people, or I'm sure those people who kind of abide by that lifestyle do exist. I'm sure Diddy's not the only one. There's many of those people who kind of like to dabble in the dark arts. If that's the case, what do you do? Do you only really hang around with people like yourselves who are into that dark art type of shit? Um... But then that isn't fun, really, because you want to meet new people and kind of gain new experiences and whatever it may be. 
um how do you do it do you, do you just do it with a closed knit group do you do it very hush hush behind closed doors like or do you just not do it and try to live a what you know <laughs> try to live a good life or try to be a, a a decent person right give your life to christ go to church you know whatever maybe which obviously is not possible someone like you know did he's probably been corrupted from early but that's what i was just thinking about when i heard it because i'm sure there were plenty of people in the industry who are probably sweating buckets now, sweating absolute buckets that Diddy's going down because they know they also partook in or, you know, or, or were still partaking when he got arrested in a lot of the fucking stuff that Diddy was doing. I'm sure that was the case. The other thing that I was thinking that was really heartbreaking for me as a music fan was the fact that a lot of these things that we're hearing, the, especially the new stuff that we've seen um, highlighted in the case that Little Rodney put out, these are all things that happened quite recently in the last, what, 18 months, if not a couple of years. This isn't like stuff that he did in like the 80s or the 90s, or the early 2000s. No, this is stuff that he did recently. So recently, Little Rod is one of the people who was credited for kind of crafting or hoping to craft the sound of the Love Album. The Love Album by Diddy might have been one of his best albums of all time and may have been one of the albums of the year for me. And now it's hard to listen to the album now, knowing all the fuck shit Diddy's been up to over the entire time that he's been about. That's the really heartbreaking thing about this situation. But another thing that it proves that I've said plenty of time here on the pod is that unfortunately, for whatever reason, the most deplorable, you know, morally bankrupt, horrendous people are also the ones that create the best art. That's the sad reality of life. The worst people sometimes create the best art and sometimes the worst situation is for you personally is usually the time when you step up and you actually you know put out some of your best work also that's why that meme of like you know a rap said rapper broke up with their girlfriend oh they're gonna drop the hardest record ever they're gonna drop the hardest tape ever that's why that meme is actually somewhat true because a lot of people kind of you know funnel their emotions through their music anyway consciously or subconsciously so you can only imagine why Diddy's music was hitting so much the way it was back in the day, or even nowadays, why we used to groove to it, why we used to also feel so sexy, why we all wanted to kind of dance and we all wanted to be merry. It was because this guy was out here, you know, doing coke every day, molly, drinking champagne in the bathroom, smashing, you know, loads of women. Unfortunately, some of them are let to be underage. Like, it's no surprise the music was what it was because he was living his raps. It's just really, really bad that he's living his raps and he was also doing some sick shit. So let's see this uh, current update, um, courtesy of The Independent. Here are all the allegations made against Diddy. Just to quickly go through what the allegations are and where it stands at the moment. All the allegations against Diddy Combs. We've got Cassie Ventura, which is the first one, right? That domino, when that domino fell, I feel like that was the beginning of the end. Maybe Diddy knew too. That's probably why he was moving so silent not really saying too much apart from some social media posts and shit he was kind of keeping his counsel i think once cassie came out the woodwork i think that's when it was a wrap my theory on the cassie thing is also this i think i've not mentioned this here before but um i think cassie was okay to be quiet and kind of quote unquote keep diddy's secret but i think diddy started to act a little bit too you know big for his boots he started to be a little bit too cocky and i remember there was a period that i remember seeing on social where I think he was liking her post or leaving a comment. He did something a bit cheeky. And then um, Cassie's new, or Cassie's husband nowadays, I forgot his name, um, he basically clapped back super hard and very aggressively in the comments. And of course, did he never send nothing back? Um, I think he basically said, that, hey, don't talk to my wife or something like that, you piece of shit. I don't know, whatever, he said something along those kind of lines. And obviously it ended very quickly, but I wonder if that was the reason or the trigger for Cassie to say, okay, enough's enough. I'm going to bury this guy. Because he started to feel like the coast was clear. He started to get way too comfortable. And, you know, it was an opportunity to kind of strike and obviously catch him a bit off guard. Um, it continues. Um, Rodney L... Sorry, R Rodney Little Rod Jones. This is the guy that is really kind of laying it thick because he was with Diddy, um, you know, helping him construct the, the Love Album. So a lot of the information he's been able to provide is incredibly recent. Is as recent as just a few months ago. So let's read this bit of the article. It says, In the most recent lawsuit against Combs filed on 26th of February 2024, 
Um, Rodney um, Little Rod Jones alleged that he was subjected to unwanted advances by associates of Diddy um, at his discretion, at his direction, sorry, and that he was forced to engage in relations with sex workers to Combs had hired. Jesus. The producer who worked for Combs between September 2022 and November 2023 claimed that Combs sexually harassed, drugged, and threatened to him more than for more than a year. You know what's funny about this? Doesn't Diddy also sound a bit like Steven Crowder? That's what it sounds like. I'm just thinking about it now. I was thinking, raw, wow, like th th this is giving Steven Crowder, isn't it? Um, he said he has, if, if Steven Crowder liked black people, he probably might be at some of his Diddy parties as well. He said he had, allegedly, he said he had, uh, he said he has video and audio evidence of Combs, his staff and others engaging in serious electrical activity. The lawsuit also alleges that Combs regularly hosted sex trafficking parties. Yo, Diddy is a sick, horny guy, bro with underage women and illegal drugs and implies record label executives who look the other way financially benefit from access to celebrities and dignitaries including british royal prince harry having read that though i wonder if that's going to happen in the prison where they're going to start selling chairs um i also wonder if like when it happens in prison if like you know did you have to start beating guys in there because he just gets bored and he wants to relive his glory years i wonder what happened inside the actual prison and if that shit will actually get out like if he ends up beating some random dude will that, will that shit actually get out or would we just not hear about it until he gets released or something that would be flipping wild if that happens he continues says prince harry is not accused of any wrongdoing he attending the parties himself comes attorney told less than times that the lawsuit contains reckless name dropping about events that are pure fiction we've got another person here called joy dickerson neil in 2023, Joy Dixon Neil filed a lawsuit against Combs, drugged her, sexually assaulted her, and secretly recorded assault while she was in college with 1999. That, was, that is one of the sick ones, by the way. That is one of the sick ones. That did you go out of his way to drug somebody? Like, you know, that is a real sick one. To drug somebody and take advantage of them while they're actually drugging and record them and shit. That's some wild shit. I think I actually heard or I read a bit on Twitter from somebody associated with the kind of case that allegedly, you know, he kept all the fucking cards and shit. That's fucking wild. Oh, sorry. Allegedly that all the rooms in the house had hidden cameras. Every single one. Fucking wild. More women come forward. We've got anonymous plaintiff as well in the fucking lawsuit. Anonymous in, in November. Anonymous plaintiff accused Combs and singer Aaron Hall of raping her and a friend in 1999. In 1999-91. After meeting at the MCA Records event in New York City, um, where the singers were very flirtatious and handsy and offered them drinks, the suit alleges that Combs and Hill, a Hall, sorry, invited the woman to Hall's apartment for an after party where the plaintiff was of more drinks and was coerced into having sex with Combs, while barging into the room, pinned her down and forced Jane Doe to have sex with him. Jesus Christ, bro. Even though this stuff was in the 1990s, like, this is really damning really 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 damning after she spoke to her friend um the plaintiff allegedly found out that she had also been forced to have sex with combs and hall in another room according to the suit a few days later combs allegedly visited the plaintiff and her friend at her home where they were staying and where he became irate and began assaulting and choking jane doe to the point she passed out jesus christ yo diddy is on some absolute wild boy time so obviously it's going you know it's very hot for him on the streets out here things aren't going the greatest and he's probably feeling the heat but the most interesting thing to come out of this the most interesting thing for me to come out of this has been this update which i'm going to show you now which is courtesy of mobs world which features young miami one half of the city girls so in this updated amended lawsuit from little rod um who's obviously suing diddy he also included some other details such as this which says young yeah, young miami is accused of transporting pink cocaine for diddy so Young Miami is on that 2C vibe, right? You, if you know about 2C, you, if you know, you know about 2C. Young Miami is, is being accused of transporting pink cocaine, known as the streets as 2C, for Diddy in an amended lawsuit filed by Rod, producer Rodney Little Rod Jones. So let's actually check that. I want to check that video. Let's actually check the video. I'll show you what I'm talking about. But this video is one of the most legendary videos I remember watching back in the day. It's a Vice video on the popularity of 2C which essentially is 2CB, um, but it's, it's got, you know, colouring in it to make it pink and the sprinkling of cocaine on it and I think ketamine or MDMA to give it that kick. But essentially it's just 2CB. And um, there was this really cool little documentary that I remember watching on Vice that did a good job of kind of telling the story of 2C and why it was so popular. 
um, especially within the kind of you know the clubbing culture and shit so let me get up for you now so you can kind of hear it especially if you're watching listening through the audio side if you're watching you'll definitely see this video or you, you definitely have seen it probably it's from a year ago um it's a really good one i'll play a bit for you now so you can kind of get a vibe of what i'm talking about here but it's really good it's called the pink was it the pink cocaine wave or something what's the title of it called as it kind of loads up on here on the screen but with me a sec yeah it's called the pink cocaine wave high society courtesy of vice so let me get this back to the yeah. beginning and then we can we can kind of play this because i think this is really good listen to it let me just load the sound oh 2cb is taking over colombia and the word is that cartels here are expanding to europe they've set up labs in spain so if you haven't seen it already Ready. Expect to see it in Ibiza this season. Well, no. Although it is pink, it most certainly isn't cocaine. In fact, very few people who take this drug have any idea what's really in it. So I don't think it's that bad in the UK. In the UK, I think for the most part, if they're selling you 2CB or 2C, they're definitely trying to sell you 2CB. They're not going to try and sell you some other shit. I think over there it's a bit different, you know? From what I remember of this video, I think they just mix everything and put it all in one pot and just give it a pink food coloring and then, you know, shut it out there. So it's a bit crazy to be sniffing all that shit at once. But in the UK, for the most part, if you have it, it's definitely going to just be regular 2CB with a bit of food coloring in it. But again, I could be wrong. The confusing thing is that the word 2CB is kind of like a Latinization of 2CB a psychedelic phenethylamine invented by Alexander Shulgin in the 1970s that feels a bit like LSD mixed with MDMA, lasts two to three hours, and was famously referenced on the Kanye track, Yikes. But in Colombia, 95% of samples have shown that 2CB here contains no 2CB. Wow. So it's kind of just like, what is this drug? <laughs> to try to find out, we're gonna go hang out with some people who actually use it. Kim Zuluaga is kind of a trans icon in Colombia, and her and her so-called butterflies have a huge social media following. They're also guaracha DJs, and guaracha is this kind of psychedelic reggaeton style music that's heavily influenced by 2CB. Sometimes you go to parties and they just look like the drugs that people take in it. I'm not sure if you've been to some, but sometimes you go to a rave and it looks like the type of drug that you people take there. It's like if you go to like a, a dub night, right? If you go to like a dub night, you can kind of tell what everyone's kind of on based on the music and based on what they look like. And I think uh, this particular music they're talking about is definitely very 2C uh, coded. When you consume tusi y está en una fiesta de guaracha o escucha guaracha, los sonidos de la guaracha están diseñados para que cuando uno esté drogado con el tusi, la mente alucine y sienta como muchas más sensaciones. Creo que es como una combinación de muchas drogas sintéticas en polvo. Pero pues en sí, en sí, no, nosotros no sabemos. It's such a good thing they don't know what is in there, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I think sometimes ignorance is bliss. You probably shouldn't know what's in there. If you do, you might not ever want to take it again. It's probably good that you don't, that you don't know. Just leave it like that. Y el tusi te da sensaciones mejores que la coca. La coca está pasada de moda porque el tusi te hace sentir feliz. Plus, I imagine it's just cheaper, even if in Colombia, right? Because I'm imagining Colombia would you know, the cost of living over there, most likely cocaine is way cheaper than it is over in the UK, especially considering that it comes from there. But I'm assuming, even if it is, you know, the equivalent of like $10 over there, it's still probably quite expensive for a, a Colombian person to buy. So most likely they do this type of things, obviously to kind of, you know, give the drug market a bit of a kick because probably all the kids are bored of the stuff that they're selling them but also because it's probably way cheaper than fucking whatever drugs they usually sell there. That's probably the reason why you'd imagine, um, you know, what you call it, drug dealers trying to be entrepreneurs and trying to find new kind of, what they call them in business, um, verticals, right? Um, just trying to like increase um, their ability to make money. And, you know, people like new shiny things, give it a good, give it a cool name, cool marketing, branding, et cetera. And Bob's your uncle, Granny's your aunt. 
la mayoría de los jóvenes se están inclinando más por el tusi. Oh, I thought that was makeup. I thought that was makeup, that big heavy bag. Hace parte de, de nosotras antes de salir, pues nos gusta darnos unos cuantos pasecitos. Several lines. I love these trans icons. This is something that I don't do anymore, to be fair. If I am going to get on it, I try to get on it when I go to the place that I'm at and then start from there. Um, I do even the same thing with drinks. Like the, the, the era or the days of me doing pre-drinks has completely gone. Like I used to have, like even with friends, you'd have like proper serious pre-drink sessions where you'd get on it for real. You'd order drinks, you'd get a lot of drugs, you'd be going crazy, be almost like a little mini party before you get to the party. Nowadays, I can't handle it. If I go to a rave, I'm just going to go to a rave and kind of enjoy the stuff when I get there. Um, but in general, anyway, just in terms of enjoying the party, because, you know, I'm a bit of a chin striker and a fucking wannabe DJ and shit. So when I'm going to these places, unfortunately, I want those losers in the corner trying to sneak Alicia Shazam tunes and, you know, peer over the booth and see what the DJ is playing and shit. So for all that stuff, I'm not really, you know, there to get like monged out and go crazy even though that's a good thing um i'm there mostly to kind of enjoy the music so if that's the case you start when you get there and then you go from there but several lines to get in the mood is fucking hilarious several that's like when when i hear several i hear more than seven <laughs> <laughs> pull it out, get a little nice little bump there, up the nostrils, there you go. Quieres? You want uh, some? No, gracias. How does the TCB? Imagine asking the presenter of this documentary if he wants to do some drugs on camera. It reminds me of that iconic clip of, um, what's his face? Oh, I forgot his flipping name. Little Keith's younger brother. When he's, when he asks that guy if he wants a perk. It reminds me of that kind of iconic clip. Anyway, you get the gist. You get the gist of 2C. You get the absolute gist of 2C. Anyway, going back to this video or this kind of lawsuit updated because of little brother features young miami she's now being detailed as a as like a alleged smuggler of pink cocaine for diddy which is wild isn't it um he's he's almost a bit fortunate too diddy that he's able to be this older dude in hip-hop this elder statesman who's able to kind of attract this you know young hot thing in young miami but also somebody that clearly is about that lifestyle he must have struck the lottery. Sorry, lottery. He must have struck the lottery when it comes to Young Miami. He met some new girl in the scene, and she's with all the fuck shit that he's he's on. She immediately jumped in, you know, feet first, um, straight in at the fucking deep end. She was ready to go from the beginning. As soon as she met him, hey, fly me out, buy me things. But I also am with the freak offs. I'm also with all the drugs allegedly. Like, let's go. So this is what it's alleging in this current kind of, um, updated what you call it lawsuit here, courtesy of Mobs. Well. So let's read a bit of it here. Um, let's see what it actually says regarding the stuff that little little um, what you call it, young man was involved in. So this is the article. It says young Miami is being accused of transporting pink cocaine known as on the streets as Tusi for Diddy in the amended lawsuit filed by Little Rod. On Monday 25th, Little Rod amended the lawsuit filed against Diddy in February. He added additional 25 pages of information to the lengthy filing according to the court documents obtained by XXL. In the updated suit, Little Rod goes into more detail about Diddy's alleged love of pink cocaine, a combination of ecstasy and cocaine that the mogul um, would allegedly procure from his accused drug mule, Brendan Paul. Plaintiff Mr. Combs Enterprise were rehousing um, for the something in the West of all in Virginia. The court filing reads, Mr. Plaintiff Jones personally witnessed Mr. Combs do a few lines of coke in his dressing room. Um, defendant Sean Combs wanted to see, but Brendan forgot it. So defendant Christian Coram called Young Miami, who then brought it on the plane with them. Private jet. Young Miami is transporting coke on a private jet. Um, Diddy was um, previously denied the allegations in Lil Rod's initial lawsuit. Exit so she she got the call, jumped on the jet, delivered it. Obviously, this is the details here, as you can see here, courtesy of the lawsuit as well. So, crazy update again, more proof that Diddy was really on that rock star party boy shit. And then, unfortunately, that's when all the other legalities also took place. And then, the other update on this as well is that 
Young Miami is now being referred to as a sex worker in this updated lawsuit, which is fucking wild to think that, right? But this is what it says in the updated lawsuit. It says, upon further information, belief, defendant Lucian Charles Grange, which is funny that he's mentioned there because isn't he the new husband of like, what's her face? Um, Christina Ritchie or something, right? In his capacity as CEO of UMG, authorized Motown Records and Universal Music Group to provide financial resources to defendant Sean Combs and Love Records through wire transfer to defendant Sean Combs and accountant Robin Greenhill. Are they alleging that somehow Lucian Grange pay diddy to buy drugs or just that he gave him money that would then be used to buy drugs i don't know anyway the highlight section upon information and belief mrs Gr miss greenhill ensued ensured sorry the wire fund transfer or cash payment to sex workers <laughs> were completed yo you got the record label hiring fucking prozies for you defendant christian corum through her direct reports frankie santella Moy Buan and Brendan Paul would negotiate fees the sex workers received and would ensure the workers were paid one of a manners bit manners detailed above. According to Plaintiff Jones, defendant Sean Combs bragged about having several women on a monthly stipend. So Diddy was out here. I don't know sure if that counts as tricking. I'm not too sure if this counts as tricking. If you give women a monthly stipend to basically be what on call for you. So he can basically do what he did to little young Miami where it's like, hey, I need some 2C, jump on a jet and bring me what I've got left in my house. Like, I I'm guessing that's what it means. It's almost like a retainer. Um, but Jesus, this is wild, right? Absolutely wild. Um, it says here, according to Plaintiff Jones, the women who receive these payments are Carisha Romika, Brownlee, also known as Young Miami, Jade Ramey, also known as Jade, and Daphne Joy um, Cervantes Navarez, also known as Daphne. And Daphne, I think, is the person that Diddy and 50 were beefing over. That's um, 50's baby mother, who then Diddy ended up hooking up with in the end, which is kind of wild in itself, right? You take your enemy's baby mother and you turn her into a sex worker. That's pretty insane. <laughs> that's, a, that's a mad way to get someone back in it. I'm going to take your fucking baby mum and turn her into a prosy. Absolutely wild. Because when I think of sex work, I don't think of like the overall term. The thing I think about is like just a, a high, like an, you know, a fancy term for an escort, basically. Which is basically what he turned the young Miami into, which is wild. Based on the information and belief, they received payment by a wire transfer from Robin Greenhill. It is unclear if they were provided appropriate United States federal tax do documents for these payments or if they independently declare these payments on their taxes. Either way, one absolute wild situation to be in. Again, I'm still perplexed why Diddy couldn't just do this freak shit legitimately um, with consenting adults who didn't mind to get up to all this nonsense and why it had to be you know illegal shit where it had to be kind of at, at the you know at the abuse of others in order for him to get something you know the little the little rod situation also was horrible because he just wanted to from the sounds of it make records he wanted to be able to have the production credits of working on a love album he wanted to have a look he wanted to get his clout up and then it turned into a horror show because they then turned it into like one big sex orgy thing as the album was being put together absolutely heinous absolutely disgusting um let's hope some justice is met off the back of this but you know it's going to be probably a long time before this actually all goes to court anyway in the first place but you can only hope one can only hope moving on from that one we've got this absolutely insane news courtesy of abc news and bloomberg have you seen this mcdonald's is to add free crispy cream donuts to the menus nationwide mcdonald's has finally given up on the idea of trying to be healthy because there was a period of time which i never really understood either maybe it was a consequence of like fighting back against the super size me maybe it was the growing you know obesity crisis around the world maybe it was pressure from parents i don't know what it was but for every reason mcdonald's tried to play like the healthy game they tried to like pretend they were earl one or like, I don't know what the other salad places call there in the States, but they tried to pretend they were like one of those type of places where they could offer you options of like salads and carrot sticks and all this sort of shit. It's like nobody's going to McDonald's to eat a fucking salad. When you go to the Golden Arches, you know what you're going there for. You're going there for a burger, you're going there for some fries, maybe some nuggets and shit, a shake, a McFlurry. 
but you're not going there for fucking vegetables especially like in a salad maybe vegetables in your burger right cool but not on the fucking salad no one should be doing that anyway the most i'll probably do if i went there and i wanted some sort of salad um you know food to eat would be some sort of wrap right some sort of like tortilla wrap and then you stick a bunch of fucking you know dried up fucking greens in it with some you know processed meats and then you hope for the best that's what i'll probably do but i'm glad to see that madonna's are finally seeing the light of day and be like you know what forget all that healthy shit let's get crispy creams on board because i've always wondered too why they don't have better sweet snacks in mcdonald's especially in the in the uk the, the uk mcdonald's for the most part outside of what outside of a mcflurry the sweet snacks aren't that great right apple pie yeah after a while gets a bit dead um the cookies i'm not interested never really tried it don't really care they've got that hundreds and thousands um um, donut i always see when if i'm ordering it on my phone or some shit but in general the sweet snacks in mcdonald's aren't that great so a Krispy cream collaboration is pretty cool because you know for the most part you don't really go out of your way to go to a Krispy cream unless you pass one by but if most mcdonald's it because i'd imagine there's probably more mcdonald locations than Krispy cream locations around the world it'll give you an easy excuse to you know to grab a couple of donuts while you're grabbing a couple of double cheeseburgers and shit now it's super fatty it's super deadly it probably isn't the best advice for people out there but but if you're in the mood for it why the fuck not so let's read the article here courtesy of bloomberg that kind of digs a bit deeper into the whole thing so it says Krispy Kreme shares had their biggest, biggest gain ever after McDonald's Corp agreed to bring the chain's donuts to its restaurants across the US. Oh, it's the US only. It's not in the UK. Uh, to be fair, the UK's got quite strict rules when it comes to this sort of shit. So it probably won't ever come over here. I'd imagine, right? Jamie Oliver will probably blow a gasket if they did do this. But it says in the burger giant's latest effort to attract diners for breakfast and all day snacking, Krispy Kreme sugary pastries will first become available at some McDonald's later this year. The company said in a statement on Tuesday, a nationwide roller is expected at the end of 2026. So they should probably just have the full assortment of, my, of fucking Krispy Kreme donuts there. They should probably have that. Just have a little kiosk in the inside or make them in there, whatever they need to do in terms of, you know, getting it sorted. But just having free and having them all be plain and shit is fucking shit. They should just get the whole assortment in there and really start making it pop up. You know what I mean? Krispy Kreme shares jumped 39% in New York trading, the biggest one day rise since the company's July 2021 initial public offering. Wow. The biggest jump since they since they fucking IPO'd. That's fucking crazy. Uh, McDonald's stock um, was unchanged for the day. Adding Krispy Kreme to its menu gives McDonald's a chance to unlock new business opportunities in the breakfast category throughout the day. Oh, so there's a competition in the breakfast. Who who else? Who are McDonald's competing with in the bre in the breakfast category? Huh? Because over here in the UK, I think for the most part, they they they've probably crushed it. Most people, when they're coming back home from clubs or you want to grab a fucking, you know, what you call it, some porridge, the best place to go to is cheap and it's located everywhere. It's probably McDonald's. So I wonder who, they, who they're actually competing with in the States over there. Um, it continues here. It says, duh, 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 duh. adding Krispy Kreme to its menu gives McDonald's a chance to unlock new business opportunities and breakfast a category throughout the day, says Terry Kassan, the chief marketing officer um, of McDonald's USA. The change tested diners' appetite for the treat in 160 uh, McDonald's restaurants in two Kentucky City to call into the restaurant. The lineup will include free Krispy Kreme, most popular donuts, the original glaze, the chocolate ice with sprinkles, and the chocolate ice cream field. Those are the three most popular donuts. Two of them have chocolate. Interesting. I thought it'd be different flavors, to be fair. Which will be delivered at McDonald's locations every day. Um, okay, so they're going to be freshly made, delivered every day. For Krispy Kreme, the deal would be more than double the locations which where consumers can buy the products. Chief Executive Officer Josh um, Charlesworth said McDonald's had more than 13,000 restaurants in the US as of December 31st. 13,000! So those are different locations. That's why people say McDonald's, similar to WeWork, is more of a you know a property um company or a landlord than it is a fucking restaurant because they've got thirteen thousand different locations thirteen thousand tech quote unquote buildings that they probably own as well mad the donut chain has more than fourteen thousand points of access according to the statement on tuesday 
Okay, so they've got a few more. I didn't know that. I actually thought there'll be more McDonald's locations than Krispy Kreme, but I guess not. But also, you know, most of these locations are also in like the most, you know, the best areas within most metropolitan cities. So they're going to want to have that collaboration. The addition of Krispy Kreme is the latest change in McDonald's bakery lineup. The chain discontinued its apple fritter, blueberry muffin and cinnamon roll from its restaurant to 2023. It's kept its chocolate chip cookies, baked apple pie and frozen desserts. Krispy Kreme shares up 15% this year through Tuesday, well ahead of the 22.2% rise of the Russell 2000 index. McDonald's was down 6%. So again, I'm all for it. I love it. I think McDonald's should have always been on this unhealthy shit anyway. Them dilly-dallying with the whole like healthy thing and trying to be healthy and doing it you know because if you're going to do the healthy thing you have to go all the way um so having actually maybe a salad bar people can construct a salad and shit might have worked out but of course that would require investment and money and who wants to take that risk when you're already crushing it doing the thing that you're already known for so i understand the pivot back to the you know obesity line and then i guess maybe their conscience is somewhat clear now maybe with the introduction of zempic sounds a bit crazy but maybe that's plays into it now that Ozempic has become widely used, especially in the States, maybe they're like, you know what? There's less guilt now to be had for, you know, making those crazy RB burgers or, you know, stuffing fucking, McDon you know, Krispy Kreme kiosks at all McDonald's across the country. Maybe that's part of the whole situation. But either way, I love the update. Um, eager to see if it ever comes over here in the UK. Eager to see if it does ever come over here in the UK. So... This is an interesting topic because I've heard a lot of people talk about this online and I still haven't quite figured out what the point of this article is in the first place and why they attempted to cancel this young man in the first place. Anyway, as most of you will know, Andrew Huberman has been the, you know, has been the center of attention of this article courtesy of the New Yorker, um, which is a titled Andrew Huberman's Mechanism of Control, the Private and Public Seductions of the World's Biggest Pop Neuro Neuroscientist. And essentially, from what I've been able to gather online, he just is a bit of a player. And that's why this person decided to put this article, this kind of, you know, hit piece in order to kind of bring light to it. So, first of all, I don't really know why it's anyone's business, really, unless he's married or something. Maybe that's when it becomes a bit shitty. But even then, it still isn't probably enough reason to have somebody get cancelled. Um, and then secondly, it's like, so what? That's what I come away thinking of it, just off the top of my head. So fucking what? But I'm going to read a bit of this article and see if there's anything else that maybe some people online have kind of missed to kind of give us an idea on what's really going on here because it feels a bit strange that this would require such a big, you know, article in such a prestigious magazine, newspaper, blah, 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 and be over 55 minutes long, I think, as a podcast. Let's actually skip around and see if we can find some bits on here that might give us a reason to... You know, understand why everyone's got their knickers in a twist over Huberman, you know, laying down some dick in whatever city he is in. So let's actually um, jump in the second paragraph here. It says, Today, Huberman is a stiff, jacked 48 year old associate professor of neurology and ophthalmology at Stanford University of Medicine. He's given the delivering, he's given to delivering three hour lectures on subjects such as the health of the dopaminergic neurons. His podcast is a revolution is a revelatory um, because it does not condense, which does not weigh, which is not aware of public health information of our time. He does not give the impression of someone who's diluting science to university applicable sound bites for the sobering masses. Dopamine is vomited out um, into the synapses or it's released um, volumetrically, but then it has to bind someplace and trigger those G protein coupled receptors and caffeine increases the number and the density of the G proton coupled receptors is how he explains the effects of coffee. <laughs> Fair enough. Means that people feel compelled to hear him draw um, distinctions between um, neuromodulators and classical neurotransmitters. Many of those people will adopt the associated protocol and this will follow his elaborate morning routine. They will model their most basic functions on human life, sleeping, eating, seeing on his sober advice. They will tell their friends to do the same. He's not like those other podcast bros, they will say, and they will be correct. He is a tenured Stanford professor. Anyway, continues. Um, with his power comes the power to lift other scientists out of their narrow silos and turn them too into celebrities. But this scientist would not be Huberman, whose personal appeal is distinct. 
here we have a broad-minded professor who is uh, puppishly enamored with the wonders of biological function generous to interviews i love to be wrong engaging in daring attempts to sound like a normal person now we all have to eat it's nice to eat foods and enjoy certainly i did this is a world in which the soft art of self-care is made concrete let's actually get to the, the where's the meat of the potatoes come on the thing that really saved me, Huberman tells Peter Atia, was that this therapy thing. I was like, oh shit, I do have a choke back a little bit uh, here, a little bit. It's a crazy thing to have somebody say, listen, like to give you the confidence, like we're going to figure this out. We're going to figure this out. The Waywood son who devoted himself to therapy and also science, he would turn to Rancid all the way up and study all night. He would be tenured at Stanford in his own lab, um, serving optic nerves in the mice and what you call it, and noting what grew back. Huberman has been in therapy, he says, since high school. He has, in fact, several therapists and psychiatrists. Paul Conti appears on his podcast frequently to discuss mental health. Therapy is hard work, like going to the gym and doing the effective workout. You know what's funny? I've just realized he's one of those therapy guys, or kind of reminds me of Joe Budden. All these guys who are like, you know, what you de what you describe as like you know dirt bags and plates and shit i find it interesting how so many of these guys love to do therapy and the therapy doesn't seem to have any effect in terms of actually changing their behaviors and shit if anything it's just a way of I, i'm always I even validating like i wonder if like you can get to a level of manipulation you can get to a level of like you know narcissism where you have the ability to even like you know dumbfound and fool a psychiatrist who should be able to read through and see through your shit because it's quite weird how so many of these types of personalities again i'm just thinking about broadly you know the joe buttons and the andrew humans of their worlds are able to be in therapy for so long but not have their therapist call them out for their bullshit but hey what do i know a prophet must um constrain his self-revelation he must give his story a shape that on that ultimately tends towards inner strength weakness overcome for andrew uberman to become your teacher and mine as he very much has for the period of his fall a period in which he diligently absorbed sun upon the waking drank no more than once per week and practiced psychological size in the traffic and said to myself out loud in my living room i also love mechanism a period during which i began to think seriously for the first time in my life about reducing stress and during which both my husband and my young children saw tangible benefits anyway let's continue um some of some of andrew's earliest instagram posts are of his lab you see smiling undergraduates slicing staining and prepping brains and a wall of framed science publications in which human authored papers appear nature cell reports the journal of neuroscience in 2019 under the handle human lab Andrew began posting straightforward edu hold on it was Andrew fucking girls offered the main fucking Andrew Huberman lab Instagram account no way let's see if this is true was he fucking girls offered that same of that main handle he's a wild boy let's see how it says here Andrew began posting straightforward educational videos on our account sometimes he would talk over a simple anatomical sketch on the line paper the impression was as it was now of a fast talking teacher in conversation with an intelligent student. The videos of Master Fan Base and Andrew was in 2020 invited on some of the biggest podcasts in the world. On Lex Friedman podcast, he talked about experiments in his lab he was conducting by inducing fear in people. On the Rich Roll podcast, the relationship between breathing and motivation, on a Jerogan experiment, his labs was conducting on mice. He was fluid, engaging, conversationalist, rich with insight and informed advice. By then, he had a partner, Sarah which is not her real name. Sarah was someone who would talk to anyone about anything. She was dewy, strong, and in her mid-40s. Though she looked... Okay, I'm, I'm thankful. Thank God these women are of age. Thank God. Thank God they're of age. I thought he was going to be into some mad Crystalia shit. Thank God. Okay. She was dewy, strong, and in her mid-40s. And though she looked a decade younger with small kids from a previous relationship... Um, she had old friends who adored her and no trouble making new ones she came across as scattered in the way that she was jumped readily from topic to topic in conversations like me adhd gang holla um losing the thread before returning to it but she was in fact extremely organized she was a woman who kept track of things she was an entrepreneur who would organize meetings a skill she would need later for reasons she would not possibly have predicted yo andrew andrew huberman was out here 
Huberman was out here fucking girls on the main Huberman Lab Instagram account and getting his girlfriend to organize meetings for other girlfriends, but they were not aware they were organizing cheeky links for other cheeky links. This is what it sounded like. When I asked her a question in her home recently, she said the answer would be on the old phone. She stood up, left for only a moment and returned with the box labeled old phones. (laughs) <laughs> Andrew Huberman oh fucking top boy so relationship with Andrew <coughs> began in February 2018 in the Bay Area where they both lived she messaged he messaged her on Instagram oh he reached out first mm, hello he messaged her on Instagram and said he owned a home in it was a place called Piedmont Piedmont a wealthy city separate from Oakland that turned not to be precisely true he lived in Piedmont Avenue which was in Oakland. He was courtly and a bit formal as he would later be on the podcast. In July in her garden, Sarah says she asked to clarify the depth of the relationship. They decided, she says, to be exclusive. So he hooked up with some random on Instagram and that was his first girlfriend, Sarah. Big up Sarah. Both had devoted their lives to healthy living, exercise, good food, good information. They cared immoderately about what it went into their bodies. Andrew would could command a room and clearly took pleasure in doing so. He was busy and handsome, healthy, extremely ambitious. He gave impression of working on himself throughout their relationship. He would talk about repair and healthy emerging. He was devoted to his bull staff his, sorry, his bull mastiff, Costello, whom he worried over constantly. Was Costello comfortable, sleeping properly? Andrew liked to dote on the dog, he, she says, and he liked to be doted on by Sarah. <laughs> Is that going to be a new red flag for women out there? A guy that's really into his dog. Is that going to be a new red flag for these fucking psycho astrology possessed women out there? They are going to be like a new red flag, new fear unlocked, men who love their dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I was never sitting, the quote here, I was never sitting around him, she says. She cooked for him, felt glad when she he relished um, that she had made and Sarah was willing to be the, Sarah was, wow, okay, this is a big line. Sarah was willing to have unprotected sex because she believed that they were monogamous. Yo, Andrew, you've been out here spreading STDs, eh? I thought you couldn't get an STD if you take AG1 though. I thought AG1 prevents STDs. <laughs> <laughs> on thanksgiving 2018 sarah planned to introduce andrew to her parents and close friends she was cooking andrew texted repeatedly to say he would be late then later according to a friend he was just oh yeah i'll be there oh i'm going to be running hours late then late of course all of these things were planned around his arrival and he just kept going oh i'm gonna be late then it's at the end of the night and he's like oh i'm so sorry this and this happened human disappearing was something of a pattern so your boyfriend just disappears that's that's a more of a red flag than him loving his dog to be fair your boyfriend just not being there when you need them is probably a bigger red flag than him loving his dog i would assume i wouldn't know anything but i would assume human disappearing was something of a pattern friends girlfriends and colleagues describe him as hard to reach hey he kind of sounds like me um the list of reasons for not showing up included the book time stamping the podcast <laughs> yo i need to start doing this man i need to start doing this oh i'm reading too much babe i've got i've got to time stamp these podcasts you know what i mean i gotta add <laughs> i gotta add descriptions i gotta make flyers man artwork you know what i mean yo you can get away with some shit if you really believe in your shit the list of reasons for not showing up included the book, time stamp in the podcast, Costello the dog, wildfires, and meetings tunnels. And a meetings tunnel. What's a meetings tunnel? He's flaky and doesn't respond to things, says his friend Brian McKenzie. Oh, Brian McKenzie, the fucking um, CrossFit running dude. Look at him, man. He's, look, what, why is he lending his? Come on. A healthy influencer who has collaborated with him in a breathing protocols. And if you can't handle that, Andrew definitely is not somebody you want to be close to. He is in some ways, he in some ways disappeared, says David Spiegel, the Stanford psychiatrist who calls Andrew prodigiously smart and intensely engaging. I mean, I recently got a really nice email from him, which I was touched by. I really was. So basically, he sounds a lot like me. When he's there, he's there. When he's not, he's not. 
In 2018, before he was famous, Huberman invited a Colorado-based investigative journalist and anthropologist Scott Carney to his home in Oakland for a few days. Or two, what, did he also fuck this guy? Is he bi? What's happening here? What are they mentioning this guy for? The two would go camping and discuss their mutual interest in actionable science. He had been Huberman, a fan of Carney's book, What Doesn't Kill Us, who initially reached out. Huberman confirmed Carney's list of camping gear, sleeping bag, bug spray and boots. Yo, did, did Huberman fuck this dude? When Carney got there, the two didn't go camping. Huberman simply disappeared for most of the day and a half while Carney stayed home with Costello. He parted around Huberman's place, buying a juice, walking through the neighbourhood, waiting for him to return. Now that is weird, isn't it? I don't want to lie, that is weird. A guy invites you around to his house, you're meant to go camping, you don't really know him too well, then he just leaves you alone in his home and then you just do what? Keep yourself occupied while you wait for him to come and he never actually comes back. It was extremely weird, says Carney. Huberman texted from elsewhere saying he was busy working on a grant. A spokeswoman, a spokesperson for Huberman says he clearly communicated with Carney that he went to work. Eventually, instead of camping, the two went on short hikes. Even when physically present, Huberman can be hard to track. I don't have total fidelity to who Andrew is, says a friend Patrick Dossett. There's always a little unknown there. He describes Andrew as an amazing thought pattern and almost totally recall of such memory that one feels a need to watch what one says. A stray comment could surface three years later. And yet after other times, you're like, all right, I'm saying words and he's nodding or he's responding, but I can tell something I said sent him down a path and he's continuing to have that inner dialogue about it. Now, to be fair, when in this particular section, I think they're being a bit harsh. You don't, you don't get to be, you know, Andrew Huberman level smart without being a little bit socially aloof and distant. You don't get to do that. You don't get to, you know, invent all these cool protocols and give people all this amazing advice if you're also super present, active in people's lives, attending birthdays, you know, doting over them and shit. It doesn't happen that way. You have to kind of be a little bit of a psycho, a little bit of a spectrum, a little bit, in, you know, self-absorbed. Like, this sounds completely normal to me. If anything, he sounds, you know what, he reminds me of a little bit. Andrew Huberman reminds me a lot of um, Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss is similar into what I'm reading here. Anyway, it says here, Andrew Huberman declined to be interviewed for the story. Through spokesman, Abby says he did not become exclusive with Sarah until 2021 and that he was not doted on and that tasks between him and Sarah were shared. In fall 2020, Huberman sold his home in Oakland and rented one in Topanga, a wooded canyon enclave um, contiguous with um, Los Angeles. When he came back to Stanford, he stayed with Sarah. And when he was in Topanga, Sarah was often with him. One day thought it was, she says, typically because Andrew would fixate on her past. The men that she'd been with before him. The two children they had with another man. Or that she had with another man. I experienced his rage, Sarah. Oh. Honestly, these women too, like, he, he was a shitty boyfriend. He wasn't a good stepdad. That's not a crime. Why are you telling the paper this? Come on, Sarah, man. Have some respect for yourself as well. This is kind of embarrassing. I experienced his rage as two or three days of yelling in a row. He was yelling at me. When he was in a state, he would go on until 11. Yo, it's a standard relationship shit. And sometimes he would start again at two or three in the morning. Ugh, whatever, man. Relationships struck Sarah's friends as co as odd. At one point, yeah, friends are always hating on relationships, so I don't give a fuck about them. Another friend found him stressful to be around. I tried to be open-minded, she said, about a relationship. I don't want to be the most negative. Yeah, well, you're being negative. Or non-supportive friend just because of my personal observation and disgust. Wow. I don't want to be negative, but I have personal observations and disgust. <laughs> I love when people say that. I don't mean to be rude, but you're a fucking cunt, you know? I love that. I love the I love the contrast of those two things or the words followed by each other, right? Um it continues, he's like, Oh, my dog needs his blanket this way. And I'm like, Your dog is just lying there, super cozy. Why are you being weird about the blanket? Okay, okay, that's fair. Sarah was not the only person who experienced the extent of Andrew's anger. In 2019, Carney sent Huberman materials from his then forthcoming book, The Wedge, in which Huberman appears. Um, he asked Huberman to confirm the parts in which he was mentioned. For months, Huberman did not respond. Carney sent a follow-up email. If Huberman did not respond, he would assume everything was accurate. In 2020, after months of saying he was too busy to read the materials, Huberman called him and Carney came at him in a rage. 
I've never had a source I thought that was friendly go banana, said Carney. Screaming, Huberman threatened to sue and accused Carney of violating Navy Opspec. Navy Okay, Jesus Christ. Yeah, he does he sounds he sounds intense. He sounds like a bit of a wally, but again, I'm not surprised. He had become by then one of the most perplexing relationships of Carney's life. Um that year Carney agreed to Huberman's invitation to swim with sharks. So he has he has ability to like annoy people freak them out get under their skin but they're still captivated by his intellect right i'm assuming and they still go back in again they still bite take another bite of the apple that year carney invited human um to invitation to swim with sharks on the island off of mexico first carney would have to spend a month of his summer getting certified in denver he then at considerable expense human had cancelled the trip the day oh my god Huberman then cancelled the trip a day before they were set to leave. I think Huberman likes to build up people's expectation. And then he actually enjoys the opportunity to pull the rug. Oh, he sounds so much like me. This sounds horrible, man. This sounds kind of a... This is making me sound like an abuser as well. Because I sometimes do this. Fuck. This ain't good. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of having an opportunity to look into the mirror here. Jesus. In January 2021, Huberman launched his own podcast. His reputation would be directly tied to his role in teaching as a scientist. Um, I remember feeling quite lonely and making some efforts to repair that Huberman would say on the episode of 2024. Loneliness, his interviewer said, is a need state. In 2021, the country was in a later stage of need state, bored, alone, powerless. Huberman offered not only hours of educative listening, but a plan to structure your day, a plan for waking, for eating, for exercise, for sleep. At a time when life was, had shifted to screens, um, he brought people back to their uh, corporal selves. Uh, he advised on psychological sigh, two short breaths in and out, one and out to reduce stress. He pulled countless people from their laptops and put them in a rhythm with the sun. Thank you for all you do to better humanity. Read comments on YouTube. You may have just saved my life, man. If Andrew Human was science teacher for everyone in the world, no one would have missed even a single class. That's true, to be fair, but I I'm surprised. He I don't know why I heard. I feel like I heard about him before the pandemic. But maybe he did blow up during the pandemic. That, this does make a lot of sense because I did remember hearing his name often during the pandemic, especially on other podcasts as well. So that was probably a time when things went fucking bananas for him. So big up Huberman for that one. Asked by time last year for a definition of fun, Huberman says, I learn and like to exercise. Among his most famous episodes is one which he declares moderate drinking to be decidedly unhealthy. As Mackenzie puts it, I don't think anyone or anything, including prohibition, has ever made more people think about alcohol than Andrew Huberman very good point very good point brian mckenzie while he claims repeatedly that he doesn't want to demonize alcohol he fails to mask his obvious disapproval for anyone who consumes alcohol in any quantity he follows a time-restricted eating schedule he discusses constraint even in joy um, because a dopamine spike is invariably followed by a drop uh, below baseline he explains how even a small pleasure like a cup of coffee before every workout reduces the capacity to release dopamine Huberman frequently refers to the importance of social contact and peace commitment. In 2021, Sarah says that she read Huberman's journal and discovered a reference for cheating. She says, she was, she says, gutted. I hear you are saying you are angry and hurt. He texts her the same day. I will hear you as much as long as you need it for us. Andrew and Sarah wanted children together. Optimizers sometimes prefer not to conceive naturally. One can exert more control when procreation involves a lab. <laughs> <laughs> yo Cuban went to control her birth yo Sarah began the first of several rounds of IVF a spokesman who been denies that he and Sarah decided to have children together clarifying that they decided to create embryos by IVF in 2021 she tested positive for a high form of HPV one of the various linked to cervo cervo sorry, cervical cancer I had never tested positive Oh no, is she accusing Andrew of giving a, a, a fucking HPV? And they've been testing regularly for 10 years. According to CDC, there's a currently no approved test for HPV in men. When she brought it up, she says he told her you could have contacted HPV for many things. I'd been remiss if I didn't ask about truth telling and deception, Andrew told evolutionary um, psychologist David Boss on November 2021 episode of Human Lab, in which he says humans select, keep, and romantic partners in short and long term. They were talking about regularities 
um, across cultures and mates' preferences. Could you tell us, Andrew says, about how men and women leverage deception? <laughs> this guy talks very honestly in his podcast about everything that he actually does in real life. I love this, Andrew guy. Deception versus truth telling and communicating some of the things around mate selection. Effective tactics for men, said a gravel voice 68 year old bus, are often displaying cues to long term interest. Men tend to exaggerate the depths of their feelings for a woman, <laughs> aka lie. <laughs> lie for the niash. Um, let's talk about infidelity in committed relationships, says Andrew. I'm guessing it does happen. Men who have affairs tend to have affairs with a large number of affair partners, and so which then, by definition, can't be long lasting. You can't, said David Bus Riley. You have the long term affairs with six different partners. Yeah, said Andrew. Unless he's um and here's Andrew looks into the distance, juggling multiple uh phone accounts or something of that sort. Right, right, right. And some men try to do that, but I think it could be very taxing. So Huben was basically telling on himself on this po on this pod. By 2022, um, Andrew was legitimately famous. Typically, headlines will read, I tried the Stanford Press's top productivity routine. Google CEO uses non-sleep, deep, relax. And then in June 2022, they fully combined live. Sarah relocated their family to Malibu to be with him. According to Sarah, Andrew's rage intensified with cohabitation. He fixated on her decision to have children with another man. Um, she says that he told her that being with her was like bobbing for apples with feces. What? He said being with her was like bobbing for apples and feces. Yo, these white people insults to women are crazy. Imagine saying that to a girl. It's like bobbing for apples and feces. Jeez. The pattern of your 11 years while rooted in subconscious drivers, he told her in December 2021, creates a nearly impossible set of hurdles for us you have to change. What the fuck does that even mean? The pattern of your 11 years while rooted in some conscious drivers creates a nearly impossible set of hurdles for us. You have to change. He's talking to her like she's a podcast guest. Sarah was in fact changing. She felt herself getting smaller, constantly appeasing. She apologized again and again and again. I've been selfish, childish, confused. As a result, I need your protection. A spokesman said that he was very much in control of his emotions. Um... The first round of IVF did not produce healthy embryos. In the spring of 2022, enraged again about her past, Andrew asked Sarah to explain in detail what he called her, um, what he called her her bad choices, most especially having a second child. She wrote it out and it read it out aloud to him. A spokesperson for IVF denies this incident and says he did not regard her as having a second child as a bad choice. I think it's important to recognize that we have a model of someone here a model of somebody who should conduct themselves and if they do something that is out of sync maybe it's on us our model is just off human speciality lies in narrow field visual system wiring how comfortable one feels with science program propagated on human lab depends entirely on how much leeway one is willing to give a man who expounds on multiple hours a week on subjects his distractors note that human exfoliates ex sorry, extrapolates widely from limited animal studies and post it certainly um, where there were ambiguity there are quack guests but these are greatly outnumbered by profound complex patient and often moving descriptions of biological process human lab is a precise on the image of working scientists let's continue here it's a postdoc working on her own funding alone in the lab is i'll say researcher in stanford the lab says the researcher was scaling down on covid duh, duh, duh. i want to see some of the other cheating stuff here on every episode of the Zero Cost podcast, Huberman gives a lengthy endorsement of the powder formerly known as Athletic Greens as AG1. It's one of the things to hear Athletic Greens promoted by Joe Rogan. It's perhaps another to hear somebody who sells himself as Stanford University scientist just back from the lab proclaim that this $79 a month powder covers all your foundational nutritional needs. In an industry not noted for its integrity, AG1 is, according to the writer and professional debunker, Derek Berris, one of the most egregious players in the game. Here, we have a powder that contains, according to its own marketing, 75% active ingredients, far more than a typical supplement, which would seem a selling point for more the inconvenience of the masses. Um, as performance nutritionist Adam McDonald points out, the vast number of ingredients in indicates that each ingredient which may or may not promote good health in a certain dose is likely included in minuscule amounts. 
Ah, oh, so AG1 isn't actually legit. That's surprising to hear, not. Though consumers are left to do the maths themselves, the company keeps many of the numbers proprietary. We can almost guarantee that literally every supplement or ingredient within these proprietary blend is underdosed, says Dr. McDonald. Um, he says that they don't appear to add up in anything the research has shown to be meaningful. And indeed, the problem with most of the pro probiotics is that they're typically not con um, concentrated enough to actually colonize. One learns from Dr. Lynn Norton in November 22 episode of the Human Lab. AG1 argues that probiotics are the effect of the same five the different ingredients. When Sarah was suspicious about Andrew's intentions or interaction with another woman, he had a particular way of talking about women in question. She says he said the women were stalkers, alcoholics, compulsive liars. He told her that one woman tore her hair out with chunks of flesh attached to it. He told her a story about a woman who fabricated a story about a dead baby to entrap him. Most of the time, Sarah believed him. The women probably were crazy. He was a celebrity. He had to be careful. <laughs> Yo, know, he's moving mad, bro. He's moving mad. Don't worry, babe. That woman's crazy. Don't worry, babe. It was in August 2022 that Sarah noticed that she and Huberman could not go out without being thronged by people. On a camping trip in Washington State, the same month, Sarah bought syringes and a cooler. And with ice packs every day of the trip, she injected the drugs meant to stimulate fertility into her stomach. This was round four. Later that month, Sarah was grabbed um, Andrew's phone when he left in the bathroom, checked his texts and found conversations with someone we will call Eve. Some of them took during the camping trip and they had just taken. Your feelings matter, he told Eve on the day. I'm actually very much a caretaker. I'm back on the grid tomorrow. And would love to see you this weekend. Oh no. Cool having an affair. Andrew was apologetic. The landscape was incredibly hard. He said I let the stress get to me. I defaulted to safety. And I used the sat on the hardest feelings. And I hear your insights. Sarah noticed how courteous he was with Eve. So many offers to process and work things through. Eve is, is firmly. Sorry. Is eternally beautifully actress. Huh? Isn't it? Isn't a feral. Is that, how you said that? If feverly ephemerally beautiful actress the kind of woman for whom it is hard not to look away where sarah exudes whims um winsome chaotic energy eve is intimidatingly collected eve saw andrew on raya in 2020 messaged him on instagram i wonder who this eve person is i wonder if she's a famous actress or just like a working actress they went on for a swim so they went for a swim in venice and he complimented her form Imagine going swimming on as a first date. That's pretty intense, isn't it? A little bit. Half naked, water and shit. Hmm. You're definitely, he said, on the faster side of a distribution. He, she found him to be an extraordinary listener and she liked the way that he appeared to be interested in her internal life. He was busy all the time with his book and eventually the podcast, his dog, responsibilities in Stanford. So I wonder if some of the women got turned on by the fact that he was so intelligent and so busy has so much on but then it also feels like he purposely had all that stuff on so that he could avoid commitment right and <laughs> staying in one place with these people oh he means a fucking top boy i'm willing to do the repair work on this he said when she called him out on standing her up this sucks but don't deter my desire to commitment to see you establish clear lines of communication and trust despite his endless excuses for not showing up he seemed to eve to be serious about deepening their relationship which lasted on and off for two years eve had impressions that she was not seeing he was not seeing anybody else she was willing to have unprotected sex yo huberman just busting down these women raw as their relationship intensified over the years, he talked often about the family he one day wanted. Our children would be amazing, he said. She asked for book recommendations and he suggested jokingly Huberman why we made babies. I'm the stage in life where I'm willing, truly want to have to build a family. That's a resounding theme for me. How to smash lives, he said in a voice memo. A foundational question. One time she heard him say on Rogan that he had a girlfriend. She texted him to ask about it and he responded immediately. He had a stalker, he said, and so his team had decided to invent a partner for the listening public. I later learned, Eve tells me with crash traumatic um, equanimity, that this was not true. Jesus. 
In December 2022, Eve noticed that Sarah was looking at her Instagram stories, not commenting or liking, just looking. Impulsively, Eve messaged her. Is there anything you'd rather ask me directly, she said. They set up a call. Fuck you, Andrew. She messaged him. Oh. That must happen quite often, isn't it, to men, I'd assume. Women have a feeling something's going on. They find the other woman. They don't know how to broach that first communication. Start checking their stories. And I'm assuming, you know, most women are probably into checking who's fucking checking their stories every day. I don't really post on Instagram, so I wouldn't be checked too much that often. And if like I do, I'm not going to be checking through who's liking my stuff. It's a bit weird, but I'm sure women do that. So that's probably a a very um, common thing that happens to a lot of dudes out there that are on the town, you know, going crazy and not staying at home. Jesus. Sarah moved out in August 2023, but says she remained in committed relationship with Andrew. Of course she did. Uh, a spokesman for Andrew Mimmer says that they were never separated. They were separated, sorry. At Thanksgiving that year, she noticed that he was wiggly every time a cell phone came in to a table, trying to avoid, she suspected, being photograph photographed. She says she did not leave him until... <laughs> Andrew Huberman didn't want to be in any pictures in the back. Oh, what a legend. According to Sarah, that should be a big red flag to girls, by the way. If the guy you're with doesn't want to take pictures. <laughs> According to Sarah, the relationship ended as it had started with a lie. He had been uh, at her place for a couple of days and he left for, to, for, to, for his place to prepare for a Zoom call. They planned for Christmas shopping the next day. Sarah showed up at his house and found him on the couch with another woman. She could see them together through the window. If you're going to be a cheater, she advised him, do not live in a glass house. Like a literal glass house. Okay, cool. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. I'm assuming most of it is what I've read there in the beginning. Andrew been out here cheating, doing what, you know, I guess a lot of dudes out there are doing when they're painting the town red. I guess the only issue for me in this regard is that outside of this being a nonsense article and not being, needing to exist because it just seems like he's a shitty dude, but that's not a crime and it shouldn't be a cancelable thing. I think it's a complete waste of time and probably journalists should be wasting or should be spending their time, you know, trying to topple governments, expose fucking fraud and, you know, whatever, right? Give the voice to the voiceless, but not be, you know, detailing the fucking sexual escapade of some, you know, one percenter elite fucking super educated white dude somewhere in America. It makes no fucking sense. But if we're going to do this, one of the weird things about this is that why does he feel the need to have girlfriends if he's so intent on having so many women to kind of, you know, bounce off of? Because he clearly enjoys the fact that he doesn't need to be held down, but he also likes a little bit of security in the back of his mind because he's so busy. You'd imagine he probably can't be in a normal, quote-unquote, committed relationship because he doesn't have the time to spend with the person. If that's the case, just do your thing, in it. Do your thing, live that life, you know, go and ride every day, you know, smash a couple of your listeners here and there. But you don't need to, like, be in a committed relationship with them. You don't need to give them, you don't need to sell them dreams. That's the only thing that is a little bit shitty about this. He clearly goes out of his way to sell them dreams and it's not necessary if he doesn't want to do that, which he clearly doesn't because every time it, from what we've seen so far, again, we don't know, these girls might be crazy, but from the two accounts we've read so far, every time it seems that the relationship is, needs to go to the next, every time it seems that the logical next step is to be more committed and maybe try for kids or move in together, he seems to kind of squirm away or run. So clearly he has some level or some form of a commitment issue. If that's the case, just play the game and live live your life, especially considering his fame. You know, a lot of women like the look of his face. I'm sure guys like the look of his face also. I don't really see the problem why he can't just like live that bachelor lifestyle. Maybe it doesn't go well for his image because that's the only thing I think would be an issue for Huberman fans will be it's a bit of a... It's a bit of a surprise considering how he kind of presents himself online, which I guess is an issue for a lot of people, myself included, where because you are a certain way online with your content, sometimes people can read a lot into like how, what that means for you as a person out of your content, like in real life and shit. And I don't think there's any way of avoiding that, unfortunately, because once you come into communication with somebody, um, they can only read into what you're, what you're like in that communication and for better or worse but 
when you're in communication with people um you also give them the opportunity to kind of come into your life and sort of like you know rummage around and find out whatever they want to find out and sometimes they leave happy sometimes they leave very 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 unhappy the only way i guess to kind of avoid that is to kind of just keep yourself to yourself and kind of make it a bit of a one-way communication relationship type of thing which is a bit odd in itself anyway but that might be the only way to kind of make it happen to avoid anyone really being hurt and shit but again nonsense article it doesn't change my love and appreciation for the guy i still think his podcast is amazing i think it's a an amazing um part of the extended idw i think you're gonna call them or the rogan verse i don't know i don't really think i don't really i wouldn't really classify him as intentional dark web member but he's definitely one of the best things to come out of that kind of gre verse world um human optimization self actualization type of world as well um he's definitely the natural evolution of like a tim ferris type of vibe a little bit more charismatic and shit a little bit more knowledgeable bloody blah, blah 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 but it just in general um big fan of his pod big fan of some of his stuff i see online and shit and he does obviously great guest appearances on stuff like lex freeman and whatever it may be so um you know nonsense article it's gonna it's gonna blow over it probably has already blown over especially if you've seen the recent video he posted on his twitter where he's kind of like talking about some new protocols and he, i think he names them it's something about it being six new protocol which is funny because it's the same number of people who allegedly are in this article that claimed that he cheated on them and shit so regardless um not big of an issue huberman likes to fuck women like to fuck him clearly but he also likes to sell them dreams absolutely hilarious ag1 selling you dreams when it comes to probiotics and huberman selling you dreams irl you gotta love it you got to fucking love it moving on from that one i wanted to feature this this is courtesy of a artist called nina chanel abney now i'm not too familiar with nina chanel abney apart from the shoes the artwork that Nina Chanel Abney puts out, I'm not really too familiar with it, but I did see a pair of Jordans. Um, I think a Jordan one low that I saw Nina Abney Chabney, Nina Chanel Abney put together, and they were pretty decent. They were almost like a non-linear, um, very clean, very smooth looking kind of Jordan one. Let me see if I can actually get it up on here. It's absolutely beautiful. I'm not sure when they actually came out, but they were fucking gorgeous. I thought it was actually no, not Jordan one. It's actually a Jordan two. So there's two versions. There's a Jordan 2 low and a Jordan 2 high. So she did a really good job in terms of taking, again, one of my least favorite Jordans, but actually making them somewhat very wearable, which I think is a harder design proposition than what people do with Jordan 1s, Jordan 4s. Um, I, I've always said, I feel like the, the, the Virgil off-white Jordan fucking 1s might have been one of his best ones because of how difficult or how hard it is to make Jordan 2s look quite decent. And he did a really good job, right, Virgil? God bless the dead with these fucking amazing off-white um, Jordan 2s that he put together, right, with the fucking fake crumbled sole on them. Absolutely amazing product. So, Nina Abiche did the same thing with a pair of Jordan 2s. You see the highs there or the mids, whatever, and you also see the lows. Now, I'm not talking about them today. I'm talking about this recent update Nina Abiche put together on her Instagram that featured this Jordan 3 that's meant to be coming out very soon. And these look beautiful only because they remind me of a lot of those guys and girls out there who do the dip dye custom Jordans or Air Maxes and shit. There's a, a particular guy who I'm thinking of who does these really nice gradient Jordans or Air Maxes where, you know, they have this really thick, um, you know, rope laces, amazing sort of like, you know, pastels and really kind of nice washed out colors. Um, sometimes a tie dye, sometimes a gradient it does an acid wash just really well done and kind of muted sort of like color palette very lush materials but just a real departure from the usual like you know tumbled leather leather type of affair that nike or jordan brand put together this is what it reminds me of so this is an official collaboration it's not a fucking you know thing that she just made by herself and they look so fucking hard so far no details on the caption it says hit the link in the bio and subscribe to more updates but they look absolutely beautiful and i'm again not the biggest jordan free fan but i think these look absolutely wonderful so the upper is a mix of green it's basically green in different materials i'm assuming uh, or you've got different hues you've got like a lighter green here on the mud guard you've got a more of a deeper green here on the mid upper 
and then you've also got that same sort of like lighter green almost like a foresty i don't know i guess green that you'd put it here next to the eye lace days you've got these nice thick rope laces and off-white outsole completely in this nice off-white green cream ivory type of color same with the outsole the bubble doesn't look like it's a, a clear bubble and on the back of the heel interesting little detail here it kind of reminds me a little bit of the union label so on the back of the heel where you have the the nike air logo right or the jordan or the or the jordan brand logo you have this nice orange tab similar to what virgil does with his shoes right virgil let me see the um, the off-white mo is it moma air force ones or something do you know what i'm talking about that little orange tab that virgil always does on on these on these um on his shoes you see them on a swoosh or on these moma air force ones Virgil always had these like this little poor orange tab so that little tab reminds me a little bit of what she's doing with her Jordans and allegedly this little tab can get taken off um you know some of the swagless people out there were asking her in the comments oh can you remove the orange tab I don't like it but me personally I love the orange tab I'd, I'd definitely leave it on if and when I get a pair of these Jordan 3s I'm not taking off this little orange tab on the back I think only the swagless only the, only the people who fucking you know only wear new balances every day in different variations of like grey and white and silver will be, will be complaining about a little orange tab because again this isn't a this isn't a this isn't a kind of a shy shoe if you're wearing something like this right this full green um, you know suede new bucky type of fucking Jordan 3 um, you're not you know you're not a wallflower so to be offended by a little orange tab when you're not offended by this completely green incredible hulk upper is pretty dumb but i love these anyway i think they look fucking beautiful um you know just a nice a nice shape on them as well i'm not too sure if, if these are being constructed on the reimagined jordan 3 or if they just look this way because of the materials being used i don't know either way I love them. Look completely very, very impressive. Not really sure when they're going to be dropping, but I'm assuming they're going to be incredibly, incredibly in demand, especially if you look at the comments on the actual post, courtesy of Nina Abbey Chebney's Instagram. You'll see um, somebody with the emoji that says, oh, that looks amazing. You've got Metro Booming putting the flame emojis. This person said, this is the shoe of the year, no debate. I don't care what else drops. Um, you got the real Swiss beats here saying a true giant someone else says never owned a pair of jordans but clearly this is time you've got cause the artist saying flame emoji you got the guy from complex saying tough um so many people on here are really going hot, like letting it be known that they want so these, these are going to be very in demand i'm assuming because this person also is very popular this Nina abdi chevney person has a lot of followers also on social media and clearly is a big time artist so that might add to it you got alicia keys lance gross in the comments saying they love it Fanilation says he loves it also. Wow, a lot of people are fucking are on it. So clearly, I'm not the only one that's fucking, you know, wanking over these. So these are going to be hard to get. You got the fucking, you know, Mr. Mr. Inverter of Clout himself, Sky Gilati there, also loving it, saying Swish. You got you got a Bim A. Williams saying he, they love it as well. So many people here are loving it. And again, um, they look fucking beautiful. So I'm not surprised. So Jordan Freeze collaboration soon to come out courtesy of nina abney or nina chanel abney we're gonna wait to see when they do eventually drop but so far based on the image we have available and if you do a little zoom in they look fucking gorgeous i'd wear the fuck out of these in a heartbeat so can't wait for these to drop really and curious to see when they drop next on the list we have this courtesy of jound so i'm sure most of you know that Jown put out a Made in Germany Ada Samba recently. Um, it's completely sold out. I think it dropped the other day. So if you're already watching or listening to this, you would have known it's already sold out. Everybody's got their pairs or didn't get their pairs. But one of the sad things about this situation is that when I initially, when I initially saw this project, I loved it because I thought like the Samba was is probably the quintessential Jown shoe maybe second only to like a Reebok Classic or like an Air Force One, and mostly because of Justin Saunders and his minimalistic approach to wearing and shit or the uniformity of his personal wardrobe. 
um and just based on what the stuff i remember seeing on the john mood board back in the day when i used to read it you know or check it religiously and i was even like i said plenty of times on here before i was lucky enough to be featured on john many many years ago with my shoes kind of being in one of the fucking mood boards back in the day which is pretty cool um because i'm sure he maybe saw a lot of the or he maybe was able to get a lot of the mood board images from randoms based on some of the pings he was getting so maybe because of my blog i had links to his blog maybe he'd kind of notice some of the pings coming from his blog through mine and found me that way every way i was honored to be featured on there so when i originally saw these made in germany um ada sambas that were going to retail for a lot more than what standard ada sambas go for i thought this was a perfect collab for jound because it allowed them to essentially make a classic to take a classic samba and lock it up in terms of materials which kind of you know speaks to what they do with their main line they'll take a classic hoodie and just lux it up in terms of materials and finish and quality whatever it may be so you can kind of see the same thing happening with the samba but unfortunately for us unfortunately for us sneakerheads out there it doesn't look to be the case because there's been reports of people saying that although this special edition jound ada samba says it's made in germany and clearly the materials are a little bit more luxe and exclusive and higher quality than your regular samba you're going to get in jd sports when you look deep into the shoe they were actually made in vietnam <laughs> so they sold sneakerheads a fucking dream typical right typical these big you know these sneaker brands these sports brands right they fucking don't and they try to appeal and play into the whole sneaker trend but they never do they never kind of do right by sneaker heads they always gives off the just you know the bare minimum because they know next year we'll be back again yeah they kind of take the kind of sneaker consumer customer for granted because the most of us out there who are really buying shit are probably hype beasts anyway so they don't give a fuck what someone like me thinks but i do think it's quite disappointing to see such a i feel like a cool project kind of be sullied because they couldn't exactly make the entire thing in germany they had to somehow maybe i don't know make some of the panels or whatever it may be in another country and then construct it in america which is something that i remember happening a lot back in the day when i was involved in the what would you call it i won't say the workwear scene or the workwear trend but there was a time in life where everyone was reading that website called the continuous lean that guy's blog and shit right so around that sort of era of time i remember this was the one of the bigger issues about the made in the usa tag that a lot of companies had and i think a lot of companies were getting away with it back in the day because they were basically doing what is being alleged that you know Adidas did with Jound was that they would order the different components or different pieces for a particular item of clothing and then they put it together in their own factories and warehouses and that would technically make it made in the USA which is crazy but, but I assume it, it does work because each piece might have a different point of origin you know different from them you know different from the fucking tie to the buttons whatever it may be so that might be the reason why they're able to get away with it but it is quite unfortunate that you know such a cool sub such a cool project with such a high, high price tag wasn't able to deliver on the promise of making these shoes 100 percent in germany and again considering it's an adidas it's a german brand i don't know why they can't make shoes in germany anyway fully but let's read the article here courtesy of complex i kind of dig deep a little bit into what i'm talking about here the selling point of new of the new two as i get that's what i said imagine 250 dollars of a samba which is funny because i remember saying once that when i was getting fed up with jordan brand this is when i used to post on nike talking shit back in the day there would always be a person who would post like this amazing thread with all the up-and-coming jordan brands sneakers happening in the next few months and shit right and um one of the things that used to always annoy me when i used to see those line sheets of up-and-coming whatever year it was shoes would be like it'd be the same retros every year, the same retros, the same team editions, or special edition, whatever it may be. It'd be nothing cool or interesting. That's the thing that is always annoying me. Like, why can't they, you know, why can't these Jordan brand fuckers, instead of just retroing the same fucking Jordan one in shitty materials, why not give us a decent colorway, best materials, and then, you know, quote unquote market it to fucking sneakers, and that shit will sell out instantly, but they don't want the hassle of doing all that sort of shit. So they'd rather overcharge or smack you know bump up the price tag for regular samba you know people buy it um you know and promise them the world and then not deliver which is horrible and a part of me also thinks i wonder if they did this whole price bump and you know give sold a dream that it was made in germany as a way to kind of 
get people to be okay with paying that kind of money for a samba anyway going forward maybe it was their way of trying to get us ready for the real okie doke who knows um the selling point of the 250 version of the Ada samba design in partnership with the canadian brand jound is the shoes german craftsmanship exactly his rollout included a video of the german shoemakers talking about their work but a closer inspection reveals a more complicated story of the shoe's origin an image posted on Jown's Instagram story this week showed a worker putting together a dissembled pair of Montreal um, studio sambas. In a photo tagged Made in Vietnam is visible, despite the shoe being heavily advertised and produced at Ada's Schoenfield factory. So the, the Made in Vietnam tag was found by an eagle-eyed viewer on Jown's own Instagram stories. Are you having a laugh? Jown's own Instagram stories baited them up. Reddit friends and Instagram comments turned under John's post have highlighted the discrepancy. Let's, let's see what they're saying on Reddit, actually. What, what are these motherfuckers saying on Reddit? This is absolutely crazy. As you can see here, Sneaker Social Media rollout featured this image showing a Made in Vietnam tag on the upper. Yeah, you can actually see it there. You see it there, Made in Vietnam. God damn. Um, in the same reply by Complex Adas explained that the shoe was finished in Germany, if not totally made there. So again, they lied. And it's also strange. Why can't Adidas make shoes in Germany? Especially, I would have always assumed, I think similar to like, um, what's that What's that New Balance factory in the UK? Is it like Flimby or something, right? I would always assume, or would, I, would, I wonder why brands like Adidas, if because New Balance can do it, they're smaller, but why can't a big brand like Adidas afford to open a smaller factory locally where they could do like special edition shoes? And then sell them out and it creates inc insane markup. Why can't they do that? That should that, that should that should be something that should always be on the table for most sportswear or footwear brands. A place where you can make up to five hundred, you know, shoes, and then you could kind of, you know, sell them directly from that fucking factory, and everyone knows where everything's being sourced from. Because well, how's you been to do it? Um, Davis Jones Samba was crafted in Sheinfield, said um, the brand. Whilst components of the shoe are produced throughout a the supply chain, the shoe was hand finished and constructed in Germany. But again, what does that mean? Hand finished could be them sewing the label on the tongue. Hand finished could be them slipping the fucking insole on the shoe. This is very deceptive. Jan did not respond to requests for comment. Of course they didn't. When it comes to products being advertised and made in Germany, there are no set requirements for how much of the product must take place there so if john would have put made in germany no if john would have made it in germany without making it in germany they probably would have been okay this means that the john ada samba can still be labeled as german made sneaker even if production occurred elsewhere and the pairs were only assembled in germany like i said that used to happen so much in in back in the day in the menzo streetwear scene especially with hats and everything other people just like buy the pieces of it and then construct it in their own warehouses, you know, domestically. Other brands using this messaging, New Balance Made in USA line requires domestic value of 70% of the sneaker. Ironically, those who tried to cop a pair of the sneakers on Jungle website when they launched on Wednesday were prompted with a hot, with a bot protection question that also uses their shoes are made. The correct answer, according to Jound, was Germany. So as you can see, I got the German tag on the side. The leather looks lush, even from here such a good sneaker love it love it love it even the whites are really nice to be fair i'm not going to lie i'm not going to lie even the whites are fucking hard as well so yeah big up john big up adas um don't lie no need to do that don't lie there's absolutely no need to do that if you don't mind but again you know what do i know what do i know um let's see this as well da, da, da. actually what is that what is it on reddit regarding this thing so on Reddit, here's what they said on Reddit. Do y'all think the brand is lying about production of outside of a country? Um, a person replied and says, they're not as much lying as taking advantage of the trade and manufacturing language loopholes. New Balance does this as well by uh, the way of their MIA, so MIUSA and MIUK lines. For example, if I import Chinese fabric to the States, so all the garments here that qualifies MIUSA product, even though the parts, part, sorry, weren't farmed created milled and produced in the u.s okay mad even then the uppers are sewn in vietnam and brought to germany i understand if the mcua materials were likely imported but at least you know that someone in the usa might make the upper 
Welcome to the world of where made in, made in a country where foreign workers are. Okay, cool. I don't care about that shit. But you get it. You get the gist. Um, John's out here lying. People are still out here buying their shit. And people are still out here buying their absolute shit. I hate it. You guys love it. It kind of is what it kind of is. Anyways, my friends, that has been the Axino Zinger Show episode number 758, I think I mentioned, right? If you've enjoyed the show, you like what you've seen, you hear what you like, please make sure you leave me a five-star review on whatever podcast app you're using at the moment. That'd be greatly appreciated. If you're listening or watching via the podcast or the YouTube, you wouldn't, you know, don't need to do that. Just smash the like button down below for me. That'd be greatly appreciated too. Um, description to all the stuff I've been talking about can be found in the description below. And of course, links to all my socials and contacts can be found in the description below also. Thank you so much for tuning in. Pleasure to have your company. You'll be hearing my tune today playing underneath my voice as I exit here on the audio side of the pod. It'll most likely be a song from the new Beyonce album called, um, what you call it? Something Carter, whatever. Carter Cowboy. Who cares what it's called? It's fucking hard. Um, check it out if you haven't listened to it already. It's really, really, really fucking good. It's called Cowboy Carter, sorry. Um, that'll be playing underneath my voice. And I'll hear you guys again very, very soon. Take care for now. Peace.